in my role, I direct the Texas Living Waters Project, which is literally two decades old collaborative partnership led by the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, our partner local to you all is the Galveston Bay Foundation. Uh, Texas Living Waters works to ensure that um, our freshwater resources are properly stewarded for future generations as well as for wildlife. And included in our efforts um, are issues related to droughts and flooding, coastal resilience planning, the valuing of ecosystem services, and promoting the role of um, nature for hazard risk reduction. So some of the things I wanted to go through with you all today is you know, related to natural infrastructure, what are some of the trends we're seeing? What are we talking about when we talk, you know, big scale about natural infrastructure? Uh, community benefits derived from these approaches, the need to center equity. Um, I wanna show you a couple case studies and then talk about next steps for partnership. So there's a really growing interest in alternatives to conventional approaches to infrastructure across our country and internationally. Um, more and more conventional great infrastructure is being uh, you know, seen as really expensive, crumbling, um, increasingly unreliable. Um, and so as we're kind of seeing the spotlight on the problems with gray infrastructure, we're seeing um, a, a boost in attention to healthy natural systems and the roles that they play. And those are being, um, you know, really uh, qualified as cost effective, very adaptive um, to disturbances, sustainable, kind of self-maintaining and providing multiple co-benefits. Um, I also wanted to talk in terms of funding sources, what we're seeing. So you just got really nitty gritty lowdown from Brooke on this opportunity in the Texas General Land Office right now for the CDBG mitigation funds. For the purposes of you know, my interests, I've pulled the snippet from the state action plan on natural infrastructure, um, which has some really great language in it. Um, and then also this map on the low to moderate income areas and you can see that the HGAC has this block outline and those red areas are the areas uh, that you want to focus on um, in terms of those projects. Another funding opportunity that um, is uh, coming online this year that is really exciting in terms of the opportunity to promote um, natural and green infrastructure um, is the FEMA BRIC program, which is Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. Um, so this program has an application period opening this fall. Um, it's unique in that it is not subject to annual congressional appropriations. Rather, BRIC is funded by a 6% set aside from federal post-disaster grant funding. So it will be this national grant opportunity. Um, I think calculations right now are showing that on a kind of typical you know, year of disasters, that program could have about $500 million in it. Um, however, they've done the math and said that if this program existed post 2017, that program would have seen about three and a half, closer to $4 billion come into it. So you just don't know how much is gonna be in it year to year, but I think it's important and a significant source of um, reliable funding to look to. Um, the BRIC programs also uh, got a major emphasis on natural infrastructure as well as on uh, robust partnerships. Um, and so I pulled a couple snippets from um, a webinar that they did a couple weeks ago where they were emphasizing this is an opportunity for large scale infrastructure. And the examples they gave were both nature based protection. Um, so while funding sources are often leading major transformation in this field, um, agencies are also taking a greater interest in supporting these approaches. So FEMA is currently doing work to better quantify the value of various nature-based elements. Um, and in Texas right now, the land office has formed a technical working group on ecosystem services, and they're thinking about how to incorporate the results of that work group into the 2023 version of the Coastal Resiliency Master Plan. 
So I'm going to back up and talk about, you know, what do we mean when we're talking about natural infrastructure? So we're referring to natural systems like wetlands, forests, coral reefs that provide essential services and benefits to society, such as flood protection and erosion control, water purification. There's also a myriad of co-benefits associated with these approaches, like recreational opportunities for people. Um, but really, when I talk about natural infrastructure, I mean it in, in the umbrella sense of the term. So ecosystem services, green infrastructure, nature-based defenses, et cetera. Um, and the performance of natural infrastructure is this field that is emerging um, really quickly um, because of the emphasis on needing to quantify benefits from these projects so that they can be competitive in major funding opportunities. And this is due to issues with cost benefit ratios and analyses. Um, last month, National Wildlife Federation released a new report called the T Protective Value of Nature. Um, and this report provides a review of scientific literature highlighting the effectiveness of natural infrastructure to reduce risks from weather and climate related hazards. And then the report covers the role that natural infrastructure can play in mitigating each of these hazards. So it's a summary of what we know really beyond the anecdotal um, in a rapidly growing field. And much of what we know relates to cost savings or economic type of data. Um, but it also, this report also includes things like, you know, an acre of wetlands can store one and a half million gallons of floodwaters. Um, and I also on this slide wanted to point you to the Greater Houston Area Flood Mitigation Consortium, who in their reports say that watersheds, uh, where watersheds remain undeveloped, acquisition of that land along the bayous and creeks is a cost-effective flood mitigation tool. And so we evaluated in our report multiple different hazards, but for the purposes of this audience, I wanted to drill down on two of those, which is floods and then coastal hazards. So in terms of inland floods, approaches include uh, floodplain and watershed restoration. Um, on the natural infrastructure side. So we're talking about levee setbacks, dam removals, wetland and forest restoration. Uh, we know that levee setbacks alone have been shown to dramatically reduce flood risks to downstream communities by capturing and slowing those floodwaters. Urban and suburban communities have a range of green infrastructure options. Um, so when we talk about that, that really means uh, rain gardens, application of permeable pavement, um, these things to reduce flooding and polluted stormwater runoff. Um, an example of a great program uh, where they've you know, put a big emphasis on this is in Portland, Oregon. They've installed a whole set of uh, what they call green streets. And these green streets have the potential to manage as much as 40% of the city's annual runoff volume. And then, of course, we need to underscore the importance of policies and programs to protect natural floodplains from development and move people out of harm's way through voluntary buyout programs. And that's proven to be an important approach in areas that have experienced repetitive flood events. And I'd have to add to that, too, it's important then to ensure that you move those lands into managed conservation lands and protect them from being redeveloped. Um, in a coastal area, restoration of coastal wetlands, beaches and dunes, coral and oyster reefs have proven to be immensely effective in reducing damages during hurricanes. Um, for example, the world's mangroves reduce property damage by more than $65 billion and protect more than 15 million people per year from coastal flooding. Living shorelines, an example, you know, better for our area, um, refers to a range of shoreline stabilization techniques to reduce erosion through the use of vegetation or a combination of vegetation and other natural materials. Um, they've proven to be less costly to maintain. They often offer more, um, often offer more effective in um, reducing storm damage compared to features like bulkheads. 
Um, and as is the case with inland flooding, protecting coastal areas from development, and then again, moving those people out of harm's way is essential to reduce risks uh, now and in the future as sea levels rise and hurricanes become more intense. We often talk about financial savings from natural infrastructure, and that's you know really powerful information. But on a day-to-day -day basis, what do these projects do for the communities near them? Uh, green infrastructure and urban greening projects, green roofs, resilient parks and greenways, rain gardens or detention basins and canals, these are often hailed as ways to protect cities against climate change impacts. Um, these measures include improved stormwater management and mitigation of hazards like flooding and the urban heat island effect. So as such, green infrastructure projects often require lower operating and repair costs than gray infrastructure projects. And in addition to serving as an adaptation measure, urban greening is portrayed as an accruing of economic and social value and benefits. So for instance, new green spaces can contribute to increased property values, economic growth, and business investment, while also offering recreational access, environmental learning, tighter social ties, strengthened civic networks and social capital, as well as overall improved health. However, anytime we're talking about investments in communities, we have to talk about equity. So we know that investments in infrastructure, including flood mitigation infrastructure, are lower in low income zip codes and they're higher in higher income zip codes. And this data has come out for Harvey impacted areas as well. And we know that historically underserved communities have a harder time, um, quote, bouncing back from a disaster, or they sometimes never do. Um, and we know that's true in Harvey impacted areas. Um, we know that natural disasters widen the income gap between rich and poor. And we found that to also be true in Harvey impacted areas. Um, however, we know that we've got these novel sources of funding that either emphasize or mandate in some cases this threshold of investments in low and moderate income communities. So there's really no question that successful project applicants, whether it's for CDBG mitigation or the FEMA BRIC program or whatever it is down the road, um, should really center equity and think about incorporating uh, different communities into their project footprints. Um, in Harris County in particular, with the passage of the Harris Thrives Resolution and then the subsequent flood bond, there's really a demonstrated um, political will as well as an engaged public who are expecting this kind of prioritization when we put together project applications. So in other words, we've really never been better positioned to transform our HGAC communities and really put them on a more resilient path for the future. I also wanna call your attention to this nexus between um, you know, green and natural infrastructure and some of the downsides uh, to it when we think about equity. Um, so while natural infrastructure arguably provides these benefits to communities every day, they're more sustainable, they have this ability to stack benefits and grow benefits over time, and that's in ways that traditional infrastructure um, really can't do. These approaches are not immune from unintended adverse impacts like gentrification. Scientists right now say that new research is needed research to uncover the pathways by which the impacts and the risks of green infrastructure might be uh, worsening the security and vulnerability of residents. But there's a way to solve for this. Um, so scientists call for specific community-based participatory research. So that is a process by which researchers partner with respondents, community members, to uncover local spatial knowledge and perceptions through which residents can share and map their own notions of risks, adaptation capacity and resources, and overall ecological street knowledge. Um, so the bottom line is that it's really important to have communities 
with you at the decision making table from start to finish um, when it comes to thinking about projects in their area and then be open minded to thinking about and seeking uh, various financial mechanisms that could help avoid or mitigate these unintended consequences of our projects. And so I'm going to talk to you, um, show you a couple of case studies. Um, there are so many great case studies coming out of the Houston area, in particular after Harvey, that have received a lot of um, attention at the national level. And so we all know about those. Um, but I wanted to um, highlight some case studies in other cities, other parts of the country that have similar um, characteristics to HGAC communities. Um, so in an urban setting, um, there's a program in Washington, D.C. called River Smart Homes. And this is a good example of funding used for citywide distribution of green stormwater infrastructure. So eligible homeowners can subsidize one or more green infrastructure features on their properties. Um, and this program so far has resulted in over 6,500 installations across the district which retain an annual average of 3.4 million gallons of stormwater. And this um, case study is growing in real time. Um, and in uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, there's a resiliency park called the Northwest Resiliency Park. And I actually learned about this one through the FEMA um, BRIC program webinar that I attended a couple weeks ago. Um, so in this project, above ground, flooding is reduced as rainwater is collected from the park and streets into lushly planted discovery gardens that help store and filter water before being released to the Hudson River. The gardens also provide access to natural systems that are no longer common in Hoboken while boosting biodiversity in an urban setting. And then deep below ground, up to a million gallons of runoff is collected from sewer districts and piped to a large tank infiltration system where it's then stored and released once the outfall system has capacity. And so it thereby reduces flooding and combined sewer overflows to the Hudson River. Um, and in a more rural or in a coastal setting, a uh, beach and dune restoration along the McFadden National Wildlife Refuge here in Texas. Uh, so far, there's been a pilot project that has restored three miles of dune ridge and nourished the beach uh, in an area that is highly vulnerable to erosion and saltwater intrusion. So following restoration, the site was almost immediately impacted by Tropical Storm Cindy and then by Harvey. Uh, the project uh, very successfully protected inland areas from seawater inundation during the storms by reducing the number of times that those dunes were overtopped. Aerial footage after Harvey showed that the restored three miles was intact while the adjacent unrestored beach was impacted. Um, and then the next case study in this setting that I wanted to show you is from Florida. Um, and it's a living shoreline project um, in Cedar Key, um, although Texas has a lot of great living shoreline case studies as well. Um, but this one, this area in front of Joe Rains Beach has experienced uh, severe erosion with significant loss of beach area and vegetation, um, and that has undermined the existing seawall there. Um, so sand used from dredging a nearby canal that needed reopening was used to restore the beach elevation and then provide this platform for planting salt marsh. Uh, two small oyster reefs were constructed as part of this project um, and that was completed in 2017. And then as we know, in October of 2018, uh, Hurricane Michael came through, which was a cat five with a four and a half foot storm surge. Um, and this area withstood that. So the high and low marsh plants have filled in here and there are clamshell bags that are currently recruiting oysters with a nearly 100% coverage rate. So, you know, some opportunities to uh, think about um, natural infrastructure as you prepare applications, um, either for CDBG mitigation dollars or another opportunity places to look. We have a lot of great resources in Texas. Um, 
one of my favorites for coastal counties is the Texas Coastal Resiliency Master Plan that's um, developed by the GLO. Um, there are a lot of really well vetted projects in there. The GLO works with local stakeholders to develop these ideas. Um, and then they're vetted by a robust technical advisory committee. Um, currently, right now, we're working off a 2019 master plan. This is the second iteration of that plan. And like I said, there's a third being planned for 2023. But this is a great go-to resource if you're looking for a project idea on the coast. Um, and there's a lot of um, natural infrastructure features within this plan. And then similarly, there are many local resources to draw from for recommendations, um, including the Greater Houston Area Flood Mitigation Consortium, um, which says that large expanses of grasslands, freshwater wetlands, uh, and forest still exist in Brazoria, Chambers, Fort Bend, Liberty, Montgomery, and Waller counties. Protecting these local sponges of open space are absolutely critical. Um, and I would, uh, of course, advocate that you seek to conserve these lands first and foremost. Um, and many of your local land conservation organizations and other NGOs are great potential partners to talk to about these opportunities in particular. You know, many of our NGO entities uh, oftentimes are not eligible to apply directly for, for funds. Um, and so, you know, we're always looking for opportunities to work with you on flood mitigation solutions. And I'd be happy to connect folks to any local groups if that interests you. Um, with that, I'll conclude and just thank you for your time. Um, my contact information is on this slide and I'd be happy to follow up with anyone one-on-one, -on -one, connect you with different reports, um, and just thank you so much.